Loving Kindness Sutra of the Pali Canon. So, with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies and downward to the depths, outward and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. So this morning we uh, read these words together. Uh, we made the practice of speaking them. And it's quite a thing to um, translate the pretty words into something that actually shows up uh, in your like your real day, you know the way the way life actually shows up. I don't know about you, but when I hear when I my boundless heart radiating kindness over the entire world, I don't get a ten out of ten on that for myself. <laughs> I'm pretty good, um, but it's it's a beautiful uh, image that's painted, and in fact. I think we all do, in some way, know a version of that space, uh, of what it actually is to have some sense of your love and kindness truly radiating everywhere. Uh, and we don't stay there. Um, the Buddha taught us very clearly that all states are impermanent, right? Uh, we don't use our meditation practice as a way of chasing some perfected kind of state, uh, which sounds like the poetry. Um, it's something much deeper than a state, although states are true. States come, they go, some are more useful than others. The true compassion of Karuna uh, that Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva actually is, is not a mere state of mind. It's not limited to that. It's not about feeling a certain way. It's not about having some kind of uh, what we would imagine to be graceful experience 24-7. The fact of having an ungraceful moment is no evidence to your lack of practice. And still... With a boundless heart, one should cherish all beings. And still, with a boundless heart, should one cherish all beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world. Of course, the place where that starts is to actually cherish this being. The being that you find yourself being right now. Really, can we radiate kindness at least to the edges of our own skin to start with? Uh, can I tolerate myself? Can I be kind to myself? You know, lo and behold, may I even yet love myself? Because we've all heard it said, you know, if we can't, if we can't love ourselves, it's very much impossible to love another. And so when we sit, when we practice, it's not a matter of using some kind of internal technology to create a state to escape the drudgery of everyday practice in life. Rather, it's a matter of learning how to love yourself and how to love your life as, the, as it actually is showing up. And then this builds and grows and radiates. So this boundless heart, this limitless heart, also means limitless mind. It's, it's heart, mind, hara. It's the whole thing.
spreading upward to the skies. We like that part. We like the happy sky rainbow part. <laughs> but it's very telling that our sutra says, where do I go? Upward to the skies and downward to the depths. See, it includes the dark corners. It includes the difficult places. Thoroughly, thoroughly includes the dark places. They are not separate. Somehow, if we could, we would paint a picture of our experience where it's always sweetness and light and rainbows and unicorns <laughs> and Smurfs, as I always like to say. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, living any amount of time at all, we encounter other textures, right? How can we be even down into the depths of this hurts like crazy, and I'm not sure I can take it another second, and be in that space and still be kind? Even when it's not kind. So this is this is the leap of Zen, really. If you can see through this thing, if you can see how it's not just about cajoling yourself into being a nice person all the time and pretending everything is okay when it's not, it's something much, much, much more real than that. Although that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with putting yourself in a good place better than putting yourself in a negative place. But this loving kindness that's being talked about, it does reach the beautiful bliss states. They're cool, go for them. I like them too. But it also goes down to the depths. I'm alone. I'm crushed. Or I'm smothered. Get away. I can't stand myself one more moment. How could I have done that again? All the way to, I'm amazing. I love my life. I am awesome. It's just like every other being, right? We just go, we ride these waves up and down and enjoy it. Don't miss that. That's fine. You don't need to make a Vulcan of yourself and sort of narrow your bandwidth. <laughs> Some sign of bizarre Zen, I feel nothing, I'm attached to nothing. No, that's not it either. It's not sort of cutting parts of yourself off and leaving them outside the door so you're safe. No, no, no. All of you is in the mix here. That intellect, that libido, that passion, all of it, from the skies, beautiful heights, to the depths, and the darkest corner, take the whole thing and hold it in that mudra, carefully, lovingly, with great kindness. outward and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down. Now just to be clear, having a sense of severity or perhaps anger is no problem. It's hatred. See, there are many bodhisattvas that show up as being very severe dudes and women, very powerful figures of great ferocity and energy and power. That's no problem. That's not hatred, though. Hatred is a completely different thing from being powerful. Right? Hatred. It's one of the great poisons that we study in our Dharma together. And basically what hatred is, is I am not that. That's hate. Greed is, it's all mine. It's just the other side of it. And at the linchpin of those two poisons is this me, this I, that's firmly embedded right there at that nexus point, saying, not this or mine. 
That's not the same thing as enjoying the smell of a beautiful rose or the feel of that new shirt uh, or the, the, the taste of the coffee. <laughs> Enjoy it. When you meet eyes with that person and you're just so blown away, Enjoy that. There's nothing in your Buddhist practice that asks you to leave pieces of yourself aside. Certainly not. And it's easy to get the image that that might be the case. You read of the great holy, holy ones who lived in societies remote and distant, uh, inhabiting misty peaks. in solitude and we think oh that's got nothing to say to me that's not what it was there was a human being just like you just like me and yet this is your time now you are Buddha please step up And here we have this, there's a lot embedded in here, whether standing, walking, seated, or lying down. This is our practice. There are times during liturgy where you stand. That's a practice. Buddha standing. Standing practice. Walking. The, the walking practice we do is not merely a stretch break. It can be merely a stretch break, but it's, it's a practice. It's taking this still point that you've cultivated in the seating work and getting it in some way to function as you move your body through space. That's huge. The Aikido that happens back here is an extension of that. It's simply moving your body through space in that awareness amidst opposition. Someone saying, no, you're not walking here. <laughs> Where's your loving kindness now? A worthy question. The yoga practice is similar. It's not just a stretch. I mean, it can be just a stretch, but it's a whole body mind experience. It's a practice. That's what makes it a practice the mind you bring to it. Seated, obviously. We practice seated practice together, and even lying down. It always used to bother me when I would be at session with my first teacher, and it would be the rest practice, and then the teachers, um, you know, monks would say, now remember, even though it's rest practice, make sure you practice rest. They're like, oh, get off me. I'm tired. <laughs> I want to just, you know, enough, you know. I've got these 40 minutes to be in my bunk. Just don't mess with me. But actually, there came a turning moment when I realized they were right. I just was not getting it. The practice of rest. It's a sacred activity. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a giving up. It's a, it's a, it's a trusting. There actually is a way to practice rest. And now it's my favorite practice. <laughs> I must practice every day. <laughs> more and more hours I'm trying. <laughs> and then this one, freed from drowsiness. One should sustain this recollection. So here's the thing, okay? It takes, the way I would say it right now, is it takes a lot of power to do this. It, and I'm not talking about push-ups or anything. I'm talking about your mind, your heart. You have to have an incredibly powerful heart to have it broken open and to be loving and to be of use in the world. This is not a weak thing. And this drowsiness line in here, it doesn't just mean when you're sitting and you, know, you start doing the duck, you know. That's, that's obvious, right? That's fine. Just try not to duck out, you know, but just, be, you know, wake up. But it also means when you're sitting there, not playing with the mind stream. Because the mind stream will definitely give you things to play with. 
totally. That's a beautiful mind. And how lovely that there's a stream running through. It's great. The, the gig here is to not pick up and play with the shiny objects. They're beautiful shiny objects. They're great. There's no thing that flows through your mind stream that's, a, that's an evil, sinful, terrible thing or, or a particularly noble, buoyant, beautiful thing. It's all just human. Right? And in the midst of that stream of the mind, I choose this. I will be mindful of my breath. I will be aware. I will stay awake. This is not an easy thing, simple though it is to describe. And at the other end of this, when you've really taken a hold of it and you really have some mojo with this, you find yourself uh, strong able to actually love with that broken heart. Not just broken and destroyed, but broken open. This is said to be the sublime abiding. Doesn't it sound wonderful? Well, let's all take it and make it real. Thank you, everybody.